Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jack Williams. Um, I'm a program officer with the Health Pathways team and the Primary Healthcare Improvement Team here at Northwest Melbourne um, Primary Health Network. Um, and I would like to formally welcome you to our myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome um, webinar tonight. Um, so we'll see if we can get to the next slide. Perfect. So um, I'd like to do a quick acknowledgement of country. So uh, Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network would like to acknowledge the uh, traditional custodians of the land on which our work takes place, uh, the Wandjeri Woiwurrung people, the Boonwurrung people and the Wadurrung people. Um, we res pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as pay respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the session with us today. Um, so just to begin with, we have a little bit of housekeeping. So um, everyone is muted at the moment, um, but if you do have questions, you can put them in the question and answer box. Um, the Q&A will be at the end of the presentation and questions will remain anonymous. Um, this session is being recorded um, and uh, we do ask that you please join the session using the name you registered with um, so that we can uh, mark your attendance off. So we're just going to go through some instructions on how to do that now. Um, so just got to clear my screen there. Guys. Um, so to change your name after entering the Zoom session, click on the participants button at the top of the Zoom window. Um, next, hover your mouse over the name in the participants list on the right side of the Zoom window um, and click rename and enter the name you registered with. Um, so I'll just give everyone a couple of seconds to do that. Perfect. So um, I'll just quickly introduce our speakers before we get into the webinar. Um, so first, we have Dr. Kirsten Van Haster. Um, Kirsten's been a GP for more than 20 years, working in an excellent practice in the Dandenong Ranges. Um, she graduated in 1995 and has been a fellow of the RACGP since 2002. Um, Kirsten has also been known to travel to the Northern Territory for the odd GP locum in remote Aboriginal communities. Um, and she's just returned from one quite recently. Um, as well as clinical practice, she enjoys working in education, having run OSCE exam preparation courses and seminars at both old, the old Eastern Melbourne Medicare local and now the uh, current uh, East Melbourne Primary Health Network um, and examining for the RACGP OSCEs. Um, and she continues to supervise medical students and registrars in her clinic. Um, Kirsten is an experienced GP clinical editor for the Health Pathways Melbourne team, um, and she's responsible for uh, writing the new MECFS page that we've currently got on our Health Pathways page. Um, our next presenter is Kate Herbert. So Kate is a registered nurse with 16 years experience in paediatrics, infection control and immunisation. Um, she recently completed honours by research with her topic being quality of life in MECFS. Um, Kate also has lived experience with MECFS herself and has assisted with running the community support groups and information sessions as a volunteer prior to starting her role as a nurse educator with Emerge Australia in 2021. Um, our next speaker is Louise DePino. Um, Louise is a trained social worker who has lived experience with MECFS for 21 years uh, and has a unique empathy perspective and understanding of what it's like to grow up with a chronic illness. Uh, she has a background working with and supporting vulnerable marginalised communities and has witnessed how easy it is to fall through the cracks, um, especially within our current healthcare system. Um, Louise became ill with MECFS when she was 12 years old and throughout the years she's had many interactions with the medical system and often found that many health professionals uh, were not aware how to navigate the complexity of this multi-system disease or didn't have the capacity. Um, as a result, Louise has also partaken in extensive patient advocacy uh, with the goal of building awareness about MECFS, cultivating understanding about the barriers 
that many people have facing an invisible disability. Um, and finally, we have Laura Allen. So Laura's going to be helping out with the question and answer part of our webinar tonight. Um, Laura's worked as a nurse in various roles since 2007, uh, but has a background in intensive care and surgical nursing. Uh, she joined Emerge Australia team in 2019 um, and has overseen and delivered the telehealth nurse service program. Uh, Laura is committed to providing a service that is free of stigma and discrimination, uh, delivered with integrity, compassion and empathy. Um, so uh, we've got about an hour of content today, guys, um, and then we'll hopefully move into uh, some questions. Um, so I'll now hand over to uh, Louise. Thanks, Jack. Um, so thank you everyone for um, joining today. Basically, um, I'm going to be presenting um, my story as a bit of a case study um, and highlighting in my PowerPoint slides how my personal story aligns with other MECFS patients' experiences as shown through research conducted by Emerge Australia. Um, but before I go into my story, um, I would like to acknowledge my privilege in accessing medical care for MECFS. I am white and cisgender, and unlike many MECFS patients, I, I had a supportive parent and GP that advocated for me when I first got sick. Um, so I think this is important to recognise because many patients um, may not have these advantages from the outset. So as Jack said, um, in 2001, I was 12 years old and I just started year seven in high school. And um, about six months into that, I seemed to come down with some sort of virus and, or what we thought was a virus. And I just wasn't really getting better. So my mum took me to our family GP. And in the research conducted by Emerge Australia, 30% of patients stated that their first symptoms occurred between the ages of 11 to 20 years old. And just like 73% of MECFS patients, I was presenting to my GP with flu-like symptoms. So things like I, I was experiencing a sore throat, headache, runny nose, and nausea. In particular, post-exertional malaise or PEM is a key symptom in MECFS. Kirsten and Kate will go more into, more into explaining what PEM is, but 99% of MECFS patients report that they experience that, that they experience it. And as a teenager, uh, as a teenage patient, and look, I dare say many adult patients would have the same issue. I really didn't have the language to explain or distinguish this symptom from just fatigue. So I remember trying to explain to my GP by saying things like, I'm so tired after I do anything, or, um, you know, I tried to go to school, but then was struggling to get out of bed for the rest of the week, the first knowledge. She also wasn't able to recognize this symptom either. So for many years, I didn't actually know I had PEM as a symptom, even though I'd been experiencing it since I first became unwell. So obviously in presenting with such a vast array of symptoms, my GP began investigating my symptoms. And unfortunately, every test kept coming back with normal results, which was as for as a patient, it actually felt really disheartening. Next slide, Jack. <laughs> so when it came to looking at um, getting diagnosed, because my GP didn't have much knowledge about any CFS, in particular that, you know, that this condition even presented in young people, it meant that um, it actually took quite a while. So... So research um, from Emerge has shown that this is not unusual, though, with 60% of people with MECFS stating that they received a diagnosis in two years. For me, it took around five years. And uh, look, and there, sometimes there can be a hesitancy around diagnosis, but I believe that receiving diagnosis is so crucial for a patient, in particular an MECFS patient, as having a formal diagnosis is key to getting most school, community and government services and support. 
And when I became too, too sick to attend school for long periods of time, a diagnosis was crucial in accessing education support for my school. Next slide, Louise. Next slide. And over the years, I found I've, I found that there's been a lack of knowledge about ME, about ME CFS, which can often mean that when I'm seeing health professionals, my symptoms don't end up getting investigated. Um, sometimes treated, they don't get treated, or they get dismissed, or worse, they get stereotyped, where it then becomes more about my mental health rather than my physical health. And having these repeated types of experiences can be really demoralizing and it isolates you. It becomes harder and harder to go back to healthcare providers and continue to ask for help. However, where I was lucky was that when I first got sick, my GP validated my experience. But not only that, backed up that validation by actively investigating and treating my symptoms where she could, even when my tests came back normal. I never felt like she thought it was like it was just psychological. The focus of her care seemed to be more about improving my quality of back to normal simply because my test results were coming back normal. Looking back, I cannot explain how fundamentally protective that was to my future mental health. Next slide. Many health professionals, so including my GP, never really taught me much um, around what post what um, post exertional malaise is um, or how to pace as a way to manage my MECFS. Instead, I got told lots of variations of I needed to learn to pace or I needed to listen to my body. And as a teenager, I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> so I ended up in um, a boom bust cycle of uh, pushing myself and pushing myself until I would crash for weeks to months. And then, you know, crossing fingers, I'd bounce back um, to where I was, uh, where I was before, and then I would do it all over again. Um, so obviously, that was not a way to. Um, to keep managing my health. And so where things changed was learning about, was learning more about PEM and learning more about pacing and understanding how PEM is different from fatigue and being able to identify when I'm experiencing PEM has also helped with my understanding of what, what pacing is and how to use pacing as a way to manage MECFS while also accepting and incorporating accessibility and accommodations into my daily life. These things I learned on my own over the years by finding organizations such as Emerge Australia. However, even though my GP may not have had the MECFS knowledge to begin with, she provided me the medical care that was essentially a whole person care and it has been integral in building me up to cope with MECFS and being able to understand and navigate our healthcare systems. But in saying that, it is important to recognize how much more I would have benefited in my MECFS journey if my GP had have had access to something like this type of webinar back then. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Louise. I'll now hand over to uh, Kirsten. Thanks, Jack, and thanks, Louise. That was uh, uh, an excellent introduction. Um, I'm glad that you you did find a GP that, um, even though she didn't know what she was um, managing, was still able to help you. And I guess it's my hope that um, this webinar is going to go some way towards um, uh, making more GPs uh, more knowledgeable and able to help their patients. Um, and just, uh, I suppose, a little disclaimer here that um, uh, that before I started work on um, the Health Pathways page and worked with Emerge Australia, um, I didn't know much about MECFS myself. Um, and it turns out that most of what I did know was actually out of date or wrong. Um, so it's been a steep and very interesting learning curve. 
Um, okay, so in terms of background, I'm not going to read through every bullet point, um, but um, I guess it's a, it's, this is a chronic disease, it's a chronic illness, and it's characterised by extreme fatigue, which impacts functioning in pretty much every aspect of life. Um, uh, it's poorly understood by doctors. I think Louise has um, backed that up with some statistics as well, and the general population, and historically has been seen as psychosomatic or malingering or a mental health issue. Uh, but the evidence is very clear. This is not a mental health uh, disorder. This is this is a physical condition. Um, the WHO classifies it as a central nervous system uh, disease, um, but it can affect multiple other organ systems. Um, in terms of the etiology, basically we don't know what causes it, um, but we do know that it's got something to do with abnormal um, energy um, regulation. So on a cellular level, the um, uh, production of ATP uh, is abnormal um, and the, uh, the utilisation and regulation of the ATP on a cellular level is abnormal as well. Um, there's a whole lot of research in multiple areas and that look at things like, you know, the uh, natural killer cell activity is reduced, um, cortisol levels are lower, um, lactic acid levels in, in blood and CSF are higher, um, functional MRI scanning shows changes that aren't seen uh, in people that don't have ME-CFS, um, but we don't know what causes it. Um, we do know what recognised triggers or risk factors are. The one that most people are aware of is infection, glandular fever being the one um, at the top of the list, but any infection can do it. Um, that, of course, is now joined by COVID-19, which we'll talk about a bit more in a moment. Um, it can be physical trauma, so things like car accidents, surgery, general anaesthetics, pregnancy. Um, there is a genetic component to it as well in that this, uh, it does run in families and it uh, has been shown in twin studies as well that that's genetic and not just environmental. Um, now, the prevalence, you might say, well, that's fairly low, but, you know, we're still talking about three, four 400,000 people in Australia, um, and that was before um, COVID-19. Um, it can happen at any age, but the peaks happen in, um, in adolescence and in the fourth decade, and it's uh, three times commoner in um, female um, than male patients. Now, this is a really important point. The, uh, it's generally got a pretty poor prognosis and I don't think many people are aware of that. So in an adult, um, the chances of making a recovery are less than 10%. So we really are dealing here with a chronic disease. Um, in young people, if the onset is uh, in childhood or adolescence, the prognosis is better. Um, reported recovery rates are up to 88%. Um, but we're talking more than a decade later. So the people who recover do that very slowly and it takes years, not, not weeks or months. Um, in terms of, you know, what actually improves the prognosis, the only evidence really is that rest early on in the disease can make a difference. Um, but there's no evidence-based treatment. So no supplements, no diets, um, no other interventions have been shown to change the outcome. Um, next slide, please, Jack. Um, so now, yeah, just a little word on long COVID. Um, um, well, I'll pull up the definition of uh, MECFS um, in a couple of slides, but um, the WHO defines long COVID as um, a condition that happens usually um, uh, within three months of getting COVID-19 and lasting at least two months. And the common symptoms are um, fatigue, breathlessness and cognitive dysfunction. Um, that impact on everyday functioning. Um, there's a fair overlap there with um, the diagnostic criteria for MECFS. So given that estimates are that about 10 to 20% of people who get COVID um, are going to end up with ongoing symptoms, if even a small percentage of them um, have symptoms that continue for six months or more and fit the diagnostic criteria for MECFS, we're talking of potentially hundreds of thousands of people just in Australia. Um, you know, not all the symptoms of long COVID um, are symptoms of MECFS, so things like um, uh, persistent cough or loss of taste and smell aren't MECFS symptoms, um, but um, many of the other ones are. There's definitely a big overlap, but, you know, in terms of what that's going to mean long term, are these people um, actually um, presenting with MECFS? We don't know. Probably a fair few of them are. Um, 
Now, the uh, how does it present? Well, if you're lucky and you know how to recognise it, it um, you'll get someone like Louise who presents with symptoms that you recognise in the acute phase of the illness. Um, so presenting with overwhelming fatigue, stamina um, being affected. Uh, there might be a clear trigger. Sometimes there's a trigger and then an apparent recovery followed by a relapse weeks later. Um, it might not be um, so straightforward. You might have someone that just seems to be constantly coming in with sore throats and sore glands or flu-like symptoms, um, just, you know, never quite seems to get over it or nausea or dizziness. Um, in young people in particular, um, dizziness orthostatic symptoms are much more common than in adults um, and pain is uh, pretty universal. Um, and it's under-recognised. Now, you know, this is if someone presents um, early on. The common scenario too is that people have actually been unwell for several years by the time they come across your path um, um, with a whole variety of fairly non-specific symptoms. So the challenge is always to think of it in the first place. So next slide, please, Jack. Okay, so the, the hallmark symptom is this thing called post-exertional malaise or PEM. Um, I'll talk about that in a bit, in a bit more detail shortly. Um, sleep dysfunction is really common and classically people complain of uh, unrefreshing sleep. So they sleep um, a full night. Um, it's not necessarily disrupted, but they wake up feeling exhausted. Um, other people might have... Um, uh, day-night reversal, so they're asleep during the day and awake all night, or they have hypersomnia where they're sleeping for, you know, 14, 16 hours a day, um, or they might have more classical insomnia symptoms. Um, pain is very common, particularly in young people, and it can be generalised myalgias, arthralgias. It could be chronic headaches or sore throats, abdominal, pelvic pain. Um, cognitive difficulties um, are a characteristic as well, and by that I mean that it's usually it's problems with processing speed. Um, and executive functioning. So um, thinking and memory is affected. Um, understanding or absorbing information uh, takes longer and is slower. Um, the cognitive difficulties usually get worse when somebody's fatigued, um, but their global reasoning stays intact. And there are um, some uh, objective tools that you can use to assess cognitive functioning, which you can um, find on the Health Pathways page. I won't go into detail here. Um, orthostatic intolerance is also really common, mainly uh, basically postural symptoms. And just to be clear, um, that's not something that's, uh, that's only seen in MECFS. Um, uh, you know, it's an independent condition, but it's really common. Um, so, you know, MECFS isn't the only cause. Um, um, you've probably heard of POTS and neurally mediated hypotension, but effectively what it means is that the, the symptoms the person has get worse when they sit or stand up. Um, so that might be fatigue, it might be dizziness, it might be nausea, might be um, worsening cognitive function or pain. Um, and um, uh, POTS, just briefly, postural ortho orthostatic tachycardia syndrome means that there's a tachycardia on standing but no drop in blood pressure and the tachycardia is usually um, considered to be significant if it's more than 30 beats per minute or 40 in a child. Um, neurally mediated hypertension is where both the blood, blood pressure and the heart rate drop on standing. Um, there's a great um, a uh, uh, resource called the Pediatric Primer on Managing MECFS, which was developed in 2017 in um, the Children's Hospital um, here in Melbourne. Um, so I definitely refer you to that particularly because it's such a common symptom in young people. Um, there's some really useful information on um, how to assess it and also how to manage it. Okay, um, other common symptoms on the right there. Sorry, Jack, if you can just... Jess. No worries. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but that's taken from the Health Pathways page. So you can see that there's a whole variety of uh, body and organ systems that can be affected. So, and again, you can also see a lot of those are fairly non-specific. So if you're only focusing on, uh, on one particular symptom and not thinking of MECFS, you can see how it gets missed. Okay, ready for the next slide now. Thanks, Jack. So post-exertional malaise or PEM, which is the hallmark symptom. 
Um, basically, what it means is that the, the fatigue and the other symptoms get worse with effort, often minimal effort or exertion. And it's not just exercise. So it's not just physical exertion. It can be cognitive uh, work. Um, it can be um, uh, sitting or standing. It can be emotional stress or social activities or sensory overload. Um, and it's completely out of proportion to the intensity of the activity. So, you know, an example might be that, you know, someone who's uh, moderately um, affected, um, having a shower is, a, uh, is enough of a trigger to make them um, um, feel really fatigued and possibly have a headache or nausea afterwards. It's not relieved by normal amounts of rest. So it's not the kind of fatigue where you say, you know, have a lie down for half an hour and you feel better. Um, and the tricky thing about it is that it can be straight after the effort or exertion, but it can also be delayed um, by hours or sometimes even days. And um, that can be tricky. You know, Louise said she didn't know what it was and that just makes it harder if there's, if there's a lag between um, what you do and the results, um, recognizing that can be really difficult for someone who doesn't know what's going on. Um, and it can take quite a long time to recover from. Sometimes it might be a day, sometimes depending on what the trigger is and what else is going on, it could be weeks or even months. Um, so this is something that's definitely worth asking very careful questions about. So, um, you know, do you feel, do you have a really dead heavy feeling after you exercise? Do you feel mentally tired even after little effort? Um, if you if you have some sort of activity, like go for a walk, do you recover within an hour or two? Um, how's this appointment going to affect you? Um, those sorts of questions. And, you know, again, if this is early on, um, the pa patients that you're seeing have often been trying to push through because generally exercise is good for you. So um, if you're not feeling well, you try and get fitter. Um, so, and you push through and that will make you feel better. But um, uh, in this situation... Um, it's actually going to make you worse. So you can end up in this cycle of um, actually, you know, trying to help yourself and make yourself worse. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Jack. Okay, so in terms of um, diagnosing, um, I guess probably if there's one thing I want you to take home from this is that MECFS is a clinical diagnosis. And if you know enough about it, you can confidently diagnose it in general practice in the same way that you would diagnose uh, irritable bowel syndrome or migraine. Um, so you don't necessarily need to refer to a specialist um, to be able to work out what's going on. Sometimes it's, um, it's valuable or even um, essential to refer, but don't assume that you can't make the diagnosis. Um, the person in front of you often is going to look quite well. So as Louise said, it, it's an inv invisible disability. There's no biomarker, there's no diagnostic investigation findings or examination findings. Um, you might get some mild abnormalities. So, you know, the ferritin might be slightly raised or the neutrophil count might be just, before, just be uh, below the normal range. Um, or you might have uh, signs of uh, postural um, elements with blood pressure and heart rate. Um, but often things will be completely normal. Um, in terms of diagnostic criteria, it's worth mentioning that, that at this stage, there is no uh, one set of international criteria in use. There's a few around the world. Um, NICE in the UK has their own guidelines. Um, uh, in America, the National Academy of Medicine um, has developed guidelines that are used by the CDC. Um, the ICCC um, has got some very comprehensive guidelines which are often used in research settings and in studies. Um, Emerge Australia uses the NAM criteria and I think they're actually really useful in general practice because they're, um, they're user friendly. Um, so there on the right, um, you can see what they are. Basically, um, a person with um, MECFS, generally you, you know, with using these criteria, the symptoms have to have been present for six months or more. Number one is they have to have um, um, persistent fatigue and uh, reduced functioning, global functioning as a result of that fatigue. Um, they have to have post-exertional malaise and unrefreshing sleep or disrupted sleep. Um, so that's uh, three criteria plus at least one of the following. Um, cognitive impairment and or orthostatic intolerance. Uh, next slide, please, Jack. Now, just to make things really easy, um, there's actually a lovely diagnostic algorithm, which is on the Health Pathways page as well. Um, which you can work through. And if you see, you know, you've got someone that comes in with fatigue, 
Is it affecting their level of functioning? Yes. Has it been present for more than six months? Yes. Have they got post-exertional malaise and unrefreshing sleep? Um, yes. And then do they either have cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance? Obviously, this, uh, you know, it's common sense to think, well, obviously, you need to have ruled out other possible causes of the symptoms. So part of your initial assessment is going to be to think of differentials and rule them out. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all the investigations um, uh, that might be um, useful. But again, there's Health Pathways has pages on investigation of fatigue and uh, the MECFS page has got um, uh, some suggestions there. Um, next page, please, Jack. Um, and just for comparison, so on the left, we've got the, uh, the NAM criteria. Um, compared to the ICCC criteria, which is what a lot of uh, study uh, study and research is based on, um, you can see there's if you if you scan through it, you can see there's a broad overlap. The post-exertional malaise they call something else, but it's the same thing. Um, but it's uh, it's it's a little more complicated to use in a general practice setting. Okay, now when it comes to uh, the pediatric population, next slide, please, Jack. Um, I'm again giving a bit of a plug to the Paediatric Primer, uh, which is a, a very comprehensive and readable document. Um, uh, they actually have a worksheet that you can use um, to score symptoms. Um, probably the main difference between um, the NAM criteria and the Paediatric um, worksheet is that the Paediatric worksheet includes pain um, as a required symptom as well. Okay. All right. Next slide, please, Jack. All right. Um, now, MECFS is classified uh, according to degree of severity. Um, uh, if it's mild, that uh, correlates to a 50% 50 50 reduction in pre-morbid functioning. But so people with, with mild illness can usually still work and study with modifications. Um, uh, then you can see from moderate through to severe and extremely severe, generally you're talking about people that are no longer able to work, that are mostly housebound or bedbound, that start needing um, a lot of help with everyday activities. And people who have extremely severe um, MECFS uh, often also have uh, significant cognitive impairment, um, really can't um, do anything um, significant for themselves and um, may need uh, peg feeding or have a catheter or uh, continence aids. So, you know, it really can be um, quite a, um, a brutal illness. Okay. And I think there I will um, pass on to Kate to talk a bit more about the mainstay of management. Thanks. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about pacing here. So it's, it's sort of the key management strategy in MECFS. It, um, it, it might look a bit different to other um, sort of forms of pacing in other conditions. So the aim of pacing in MECFS is to stay, it is to stay as active as possible, but within the energy limits of the individual. So, um, and they're going to be much lower as Kirsten has just referred to um, in that sort of, you know, th those levels of severity. So it's going to be individual what someone's energy limits are. And like Louise was saying, it's about stopping that boom bust cycle that a lot of patients get into because they get frustrated, they do more, then they crash. You kind of want to even that out a little bit. And like that's already been mentioned, you know, all of life involves energy, that physical, cognitive, emotional, um, both positive and negative, um, and other things as well, like sound and light and orthostatic things. Um, it's, it's, it's working out how to, how to balance all those things. Uh, it is a management strategy only. It doesn't um, address the underlying pathophysiology, but it's about safe levels of activity for that individual. Um, I, I actually personally remember being introduced actually reasonably early on, but it was framed as a cure. And so I just got really frustrated because it wasn't fixing my, my, my issues. And so I think it's important to be um, upfront and honest about, you, you know, that it's a management strategy, but it is an important management strategy. Um, next slide, Jack. So the main goal of pacing is to limit how often someone's experiencing um, post-exertional malaise. And, and I do say limit because it's not reasonable to probably not reasonable for most people to never experience PEM. 
but we want to encourage them to be able to, to recover quickly from activities. We want to stop that sort of days to weeks to months sort of um, activity uh, recovery cycles. So hopefully people are feeling rested the next day or not taking too long. And another goal is to reduce symptom burden. So it's a, it's a disease with very high symptom burden um, and PEM can make all of someone's symptoms worse and it can also increase, sort of bring in other symptoms that are only, only there when someone's in PEM. Um, so hopefully when someone's limiting PEM, um, they're going to see a reduction in some of their symptoms and they're going to be feeling a bit sort of bit more stable and better within themselves. We also really want to, want to start thinking about pacing as soon as ME-CFS is suspected. Um, this is something people can be encouraged to sort of think a little bit about during a diagnostic workup if it's if it's seen to be appropriate. Um, it is challenging um, to build those safety mechanisms in, but uh, I think stopping that boom bash bust sort of cycle early is 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 important. And you know, if they go on to be diagnosed with something else that explains all their symptoms and you know that can be reviewed. Um, I've also included um, tailored to the patient's level of severity, lifestyle, and goals for a few reasons. The first is that um, for those very severe patients, any amount of activity can cause PEM. Pacing is not really something, that, they're really in that protective mode. Um, and the second is that um, everyone has their own way of doing things and doing life. So pacing will mean they're going to need to change things and, and sometimes quite a lot and quite dramatically, but it does have to work for them or they're just, they're just not going to do it. So there's no sort of one size fits all pacing thing. Uh, next slide, Jack. So, so, and, and pacing is a skill learned over time. We were talking about this earlier, um, just beforehand, but there's, uh, just before the meeting, um, but there's some simple, helpful and sort of concepts that you can introduce, introduce to your patients. Um, we use the concept of a lot here at Emerge Australia of using the battery analogy. Uh, so we say that people with ME-CFS, have a, they have a faulty battery as their energy system. So it never fully recharges and it runs down faster than it should. Um, and, they, and people need frequent rest breaks um, throughout the day to stop that battery sort of hitting that, you know, red zone, that flat zone. We also said that when energy levels get low and people start to perhaps be starting to get into PEM, often symptoms start to increase and they can be a little, you know, they can be kind of subtle, but it's helpful for patients to sort of start tuning in a little bit and thinking about, am I feeling a bit, you know, my stamina is dropping now. Maybe I need to stop and rest um, instead of crashing out. Um, so basically what we're saying is stop activity when or before you experience an increase in symptoms, rest often and, and pace out those activities to avoid that flat battery. So, for example, instead of, say, taking a shower, brushing your teeth, combing your hair all in one go, pacing would mean something like taking a shower, then taking a rest um, until you feel a bit ready, a bit sort of rested and ready to go on and then do that next activity. So it's about leaving some charge in that battery. Um, there are different sort of thing, you know, leaving these percentages like 50 per 60 percent, 80 percent of what you can do. There's different things thrown about, but the idea is to to not be constantly running that battery flat, to be leaving some reserve in your battery. Uh, next slide. So we, we do encourage you to refer to um, patients to Emerge Australia if they would like to really explore pacing in depth or if they just really need help with a pan. Um, but one of the first steps is helping them work out what and how much activity causes PEM and, and what their triggers are. Um, and this can often involve a bit of detective work using things like activity diaries. And we've got an example um, on the next slide soon that sort of gives you an idea that patients can use. Um, we also encourage patients, to, like I said, to tune into their body, look for early warning signs and, and stop and rest before they sort of crash themselves out. And the other one is to, the next step is sort of to look at how to modify their activity. And that's going to obviously depend on that patient. Um, one thing that's often missed is orthostatic intolerance. Um, so uh, sometimes things like using shower chairs, sitting to prep food in the kitchen, um, mobility devices can be really fantastic. So instead of seeing these as um, giving up, um, they're actually, they can often be a means to the patient accessing activities that were just not accessible before they used that mobility aid. Um, and learning to say no is hard. Asking to for help is hard for many people. Um, and we don't really have a culture of rest. So giving ourselves permission to rest as much as needed can be a bit of a hurdle for patients. 
And this is where GPs can be really um, fantastic in supporting things like applications for disability parking permits, um, modifications at work and school, uh, financial support, and just supporting patients in the need to, to modify their life. Um, most people can expect, um, you know, bumps, setbacks. And so just having that encouraging and listening ear is, is, really, um, is really valuable. Uh, have a look at the next slide. So this is um, our activity diary and it, it, there is a lot there, but patients can sort of, you know, some people go all out and they want to use the whole thing and other, other patients, what they'll do is they'll just pick out certain elements. They might just want to look at, you know, what does their morning look like? Um, what does their, we look at resting mor um, morning heart rate and pacing with a heart rate as well um, with our patients. Um, it's just about, and it's looking to see, well, Am I do you know are they are their activity there's sort of patterns is there a pattern of lots of activity then lots of rest just have it's just giving pa giving patients an idea to sort of get a bit more steering and control into their symptoms and, and their pacing and rest is an essential part of pacing so people need essential uh, they need frequent um, rests throughout the day that's obviously appropriate to them. Uh, and to stop that battery going flat. Um, it does need to be restorative. It's, um, it often needs to be lying down supported, listening to something quiet and relaxing, or some people just finding, you know, some people find finding reading is relaxing, restorative. Other people really need to be in a really quiet sort of um, space where they're either meditating or just there's not a lot of um, external stimuli. It just um, It's just finding what they find relaxing and restorative. Uh, and I just put this in here because it is a really difficult balance. You know, it's, it's this constant tug between I need to rest more <laughs> and I had this this afternoon, I need to rest more, I really need to recharge for tonight. I have other things to do, other things I have to do, other things I want to do, all the demands on life, the stresses in life. So it's just to recognise it's, it, it, it's a really challenging thing for patients to do, you know, just going, oh, you need to pace, you'll be right. It, it's not like that at all. Um, and so often, like I said, it's learned over time and often coaching is really helpful. And just the last slide from me. And also just wanted to give a few practical tips to help um, help you pay, help you help patients pace in your in your clinics. Um, telehealth has been fantastic for many patients, but obviously a lot of people are still coming into clinics. Um, this is me sitting scrunched up. My feet are scrunched up. I'm being very naughty and putting my feet on the chair. Um, and I guess it's just to illustrate that there's some simple modifications that, that can be really helpful where you can in your clinics. So things like if you can fit a couch in there or a few bean bags, um, mean it means people can be a little bit more supported, uh, reduce that orthostatic load. Um, some patients prefer to lie down in the car and then be called in when, when, they're, when their um, appointment's are ready or, or, they, um, or being able to lie down in the nurse's station. Um, and just other things like, you know, make sure the light music's not blaring. Uh, if, you, if you're changing your lighting, think that fluorescent lighting is actually really awful. Um, and accessibility for mobility aids. Just a, and maybe some, and also cleaning products. Um, really heavy scents can be a trigger for some patients. So it's just, just trying to keep a think, few of those things in mind when you're looking at your clinics and your practices. Um, and then patients will hopefully have more um, energy to focus on their appointment and won't go home with, with as much recovery time. And that's me done, and I'll hand back over to Kirsten. Thanks, Kate. Um, I was just thinking uh, uh, when you're talking about pacing and um, how it's something that happens over time, not just learning about it, but also getting better at it um, because there's so much frustration, you know, um, <laughs> I saw, a, yeah, I saw an 11 year old yesterday who's previously perfectly fit and well and now she's so fatigued that when she does make it to school she hasn't got the energy to play at recess she just has to sit on the bench and watch the other kids um, so that you know there's a huge amount of, of loss and grief and frustration and trying to push through um, in learning to accept that um, no you actually do have to pace yourself if you don't want to then be paying the price with PEM for the next few days and it's hard. Yeah. It really is very, very hard, yeah. Um, so uh, I suppose general principles, um, we're dealing here with a chronic disease, you know, remembering the, the, the stats on prognosis and likely recovery. Um, so the general principles are the same as in some ways as managing other, any other chronic disease, which is that, you know, you develop a relationship, 
with your patient, you review them regularly. Um, you deal with issues as they arise. Um, um, you validate their experience and you troubleshoot um, where you can. Um, and you might not know everything, but um, um, willingness and uh, an openness to exploring options is a good start. Um, so obviously number one is think of it and make the diagnosis. If you're not sure, so if you've got someone who's got lots of orthostatic symptoms, you may refer to a cardiologist. Um, if it's, uh, you know, you're dealing with someone that's got generalized aches and pains, a rheumatologist may be more appropriate. Um, if it's a young person, uh, generally speaking, if you, if you think that's what's going on, it's a good idea to refer them um, to a pediatrician, probably at one of the major hospitals, because they do run um, uh, MECFS clinics and pain management clinics um, uh, through their general medicine outpatient um, services. Um, the next part of it is educating, you know, if it's, especially if it's someone that's had a delayed diagnosis, it's a huge relief to actually be told what's wrong with them. So to actually give them a clear diagnosis, explain what it is, um, and, you know, expanding that also not just to the person themselves, but also to their family um, and potentially their school and their workplace as well, if they give permission for that. Um, keeping in mind that this, you know, there's a lot of stigma and misunderstanding about this condition still. So if you're uh, coming up with a school attendance plan, um, it, you know, it's really helpful if you put in some sort of covering letter as well saying, you know, this is what MECFS is, this is what we're dealing with it. Just having that with a GP signature on it can make a big difference um, with employers as well. Um, obviously, as, as Kate has said, um, uh, has explained the, uh, the importance of um, um, avoiding overdoing it, triggering PEM um, and using pacing at a tool that is the most useful thing and that's going to improve quality of life. Um, at the same time, I think be realistic um, in, in uh, the information you give about the prognosis. You know, there's no point in giving somebody false hope or, or uh, you know, lead, leading to, the, to believe that, that um, pacing is, a, uh, is actually going to treat the disease. Um, no, so um, remembering the management goals, I think we've pretty much covered that. Um, for young people in particular, it's worth keeping in mind that you, you, it's super helpful and important long-term if they can stay engaged with schooling, um, but don't prioritize the academic side of it um, at the expense of um, recreational activities and social activities. You know, if a kid only has so much energy to expend, there needs to be an allocation uh, for things other than education. Um, and young people in particular will often put up with symptoms in order to be able to do that. So going to school is important, um, but if, if, that happen, if that ends up being for two hours a day, um, so be it, if that means that they can still then go out to a party on Saturday night for an hour. Um, and um, be guided by your patient. You know, this, they may have five, five big symptoms, but there may be one in particular that they really want your help with. So that's the one you focus on. Um, okay, next slide, please, Jack. Um, so this is just, uh, this again is from Emerge Australia. Um, it's a little um, useful little tool where, where patients can actually record their symptoms and how bad they are. Um, they can fill that in before an appointment, bring it along, and it can um, be useful to guide, uh, to guide you as a GP as to what you're going to focus on um, at that point. Um, and, you know, it may be um, a classic MECFS um, symptom, or it might be a comorbidity, like you might have someone with recurrent thrush, and that's actually the thing that's, that's really needing attention, or mouth ulcers, or it might be irritable bowel syndrome, and you look at a FODMAPS diet. Um, next slide, please, Jack. Okay, specifics for um, uh, sleep disturbance. Remembering the commonest issue is unrefreshing sleep. Um, and usually sleep hygiene is not enough. Obviously, if you've got someone who's got terrible sleep hygiene, it's good to start with the basics like looking at caffeine, alcohol, screen time, routine. But it's usually on its own in this situation isn't enough. Um, PEM makes everything worse. So pacing is a really important tool in managing sleep issues. Um, manage pain um, if pain is what's keeping them awake. Um, if somebody's uh, got hypersomnia, as in they're sleeping um, 
you know, 14 or 16 hours, um, make sure that in their waking hours, they're actually drinking enough and getting enough nutrition. Uh, and that can be a challenge, especially if you've got someone who's um, got nausea as well. Um, so, you know, that's where a dietitian might um, uh, be really useful. Um, if you're dealing with someone who's actually having a lot of trouble getting or staying asleep or they've got reversal of the day-night cycle, um, which, by the way, seems to um, be related to um, the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system and sympathetic nervous system balance that um, in MECFS, the, um, uh, the usual uh, predominance of the parasympathetic system overnight doesn't seem to happen. Um, but that's where you, you would uh, have a look at medication. So remembering that um, sensitivities are quite a common symptom and that includes to medication. Um, so start with really low doses and increase slowly. And if you can find a medication that um, does more than one thing, um, um, then that would be the one to go for, again, to try and minimise polypharmacy. So for example, if you've got someone who's not sleeping well, um, but is also having um, chronic headaches, um, then using a low-dose tricyclic in the same way that you would for migraine prophylaxis um, might, be, um, might be the most useful option. Um, in terms of uh, medications, so low-dose tricyclics um, are, are commonly used. Um, melatonin, uh, the old-school uh, antihistamine diphenhydramine, um, I think it's called pediamine, um, can be useful. And uh, sometimes clonazepam, um, sort of a half to one milligram, the same sort of dosing as uh, you might use in someone with restless legs. Um, in this particular situation, it's uh, dependence um, and abuse really um, are very unlikely to be an issue. Uh, next slide, please, Jack. Okay, in terms of uh, specific pain management strategies, um, again, I'd refer you to the paediatric primer. There's a great section on pain management in there. Um, um, again, if you minimise PEM, you're going to improve pain. Um, if headache, chronic, chronic daily headaches um, are an issue, then um, using strategies similar to what you would use with migraine prophylaxis can sometimes work quite well. Um, if it's orthostatic intolerance related, um, sometimes low dose beta blockers can actually be um, very useful. Um, keep in mind that um, things like physiotherapy, um, um, massage, heat packs, um, potentially they're, um, they're all triggers for physical touch can be a trigger um, uh, for PEM. So you need to uh, be careful about what you recommend there. And in terms of medications, again, the tricyclics, um, SSRIs and SN SNRIs, so um, duloxetine is commonly used. Um, the usual culprits in terms of uh, neuropathic pain medications, the anticonvulsants um, can be used. Um, and there's a fair bit of off-label use of low-dose naltrexone um, used for pain in MECFS with some encouraging results. And just to comment on um, uh, chronic pain management services, um, the paediatric services are generally better set up than the adult ones when it comes to this population. Um, you know, my experience in the public system is that uh, generally the, the first requirement is that somebody has to attend a half-day workshop to learn about chronic pain. Um, and for someone with MECFS, that's not necessarily going to be achievable to, um, to travel somewhere um, than to sit there for four or five or six hours and travel home again. Um, so, you know, it, as wonderful it is, as it is that the services exist, it may not be appropriate. Um, and just a brief comment about orthostatic intolerance. I think Kate already talked about practical strategies like, you know, doing things sitting down if you can. Um, not having your shower too hot, um, uh, using mobility aids like, um, like a wheelchair or a scooter. Um, it's uh, increasing salt intake to say 10 grams a day for an adult, um, drinking enough, you know, two to three litres a day, um, compression garments, um, fluid recortisone is used sometimes as well, uh, remembering it needs to be done in conjunction with potassium supplementation. Um, there are a few other agents that, um, that are used, but uh, I would recommend that, um, that they be initiated by a cardiologist. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, then just a, a few comments on um, uh, cognitive behaviour therapy and um, graded exercise therapy, which uh, used to be uh, widely promoted as treatments for MECFS and 
um, some of you like me may have trained when um, when that was the uh, when that was the teaching. Um, so you may not be aware that that's actually not the case anymore. So CBT um, is not a treatment um, for the for the actual illness, but it absolutely has a role, <coughs> as does psychological therapy um, more broadly, because you know you're dealing with a chronic illness that really limits a person's functioning, um, that takes away a lot of um, what was previously normal life. So um, um, secondary depression or associated anxiety, um, or just dealing with the grief and loss of, um, of having a, a, a chronic lifelong illness potentially um, are all really good reasons for um, uh, getting psychological support. Um, but just be, be careful that you don't um, present it in a way that's basically saying, oh yes, you've got this thing, it's real, but it's all in your head and I'm going to refer you to a psychologist. Um, next, oh uh, yes, a couple of little comments. Um, I suppose when you're doing your initial assessment, um, if you've got someone with fatigue, you know, when you're dealing with um, non-specific fatigue, then anxiety and depression are really high up on the list of possible causes. Um, so some useful differentiators might be specifically to look at um, the person's motivation to do things, um, um, which in MECFS is usually really high. So they really want to be um, um, working more or going out more or exercising, um, but they can't because it makes them feel worse where someone with depression usually withdraws and stops wanting to do things and becomes more apathetic. Um, and also looking at well, what effect do these activities have on the person. So generally speaking, someone with depression, if they exercise or go to a social function, they usually feel better afterwards. Um, whereas in MECFS, the opposite is the case. Um, and obviously, you know, that the classic symptoms in depression of, you know, guilt, worthlessness, um, uh, self, low self-esteem, regret, um, lack of joy are not features of MECFS. Um, next slide, please, Jack. Um, now, similarly, graded exercise therapy used to be um, the way to go, but it's not. Um, it's quite a controversial area over the years. There's been um, a lot of research done on this um, and um, experts in the field can almost get a little bit, um, it's almost like an ideological divide in some of the discussions I've come across. Um, but the bottom line is that most of the research where people with the condition are asked, um, um, does exercise help them? Um, quite often it doesn't, it makes them worse. And I think that that's really important that we listen to that. Um, in some people, exercise might be helpful, but you've got to remember if this, you know, is primarily an issue with, um, uh, with energy generation and metabolism, um, the effect of exercise is not the same as it is in someone who's, you know, just really unfit and deconditioned. Um, so um, don't give generic advice like go for a walk or join a gym or start swimming. Um, make sure someone's pacing properly first, that they're minimising their PEM. Um, and then if they're um, um, wanting to explore exercise, um, introduce it carefully, monitor it closely, make sure it's with exercise professionals that have some experience in this area. Uh, is there anything that you would add to that, Kate? No, um, Laura, is there anything you add? You, you would add? Yeah, I think the main thing, you know, when we're talking about introduction of exercise, we're really getting that baseline there. So we're really understanding what are our symptoms doing, day-to-day um, -day mapping of that, you know, out of 10, zero being no symptoms, 10 is your worst ever. Um, and are we stable within that? We might then look at doing, you know, introducing one small additional activity, whether that's exercise or, you know, going to the supermarket, monitoring for up to 72 hours, because we know that there can be a delay in the onset of symptoms. And sometimes we see this classic picture of patients will say to me, look, I went to you know, the supermarket on Sunday, Monday had the best day ever, Tuesday was the worst day. You know, I felt like I'd been run over by a bus and I couldn't actually move. So that's 72 hours of monitoring and making sure that we're not um, you know, undoing all of our hard pacing is really crucial in organising someone's energy management. Thanks, Laura. Um, next slide, please, Jack. All right, so just some practical tips. Some of these I think Kate's already um, covered. So, you know, really practical things about conserving energy um, if attending the clinic. Use telehealth if possible. 
um, home visits, particularly if you're dealing with someone who's uh, got severe or very severe ME CFS. Um, think about writing um, notes after an appointment um, that might sum up what the plan is. Um, um, offer to communicate with the, the school or the employer. Um, and then there's the, the, you know, the practical supports that you can be proactive in arranging and there's, I've just listed them there. Um, don't forget the medical cooling concession, the MECFS is on the list of approved conditions for that. Um, now, when it comes to NDIS applications, um, which I think uh, is uh, the bane of uh, many of our lives, um, um, it is, MECFS is on the list of uh, conditions uh, to make, that make someone eligible for NDIS funding. Um, uh, the word on the street and my personal experience seems to be that those uh, applications have uh, so far often been unsuccessful. Um, there is some, um, some lobbying and discussion going on at fairly high levels in the government departments. Um, so um, we're hoping that that might change. Um, but given that the NDIS application process is really heavily focused on functioning, that really can be something where a GP can help. Um, there's a few tools that um, I've listed there that are on the Health Pathways page as well that you can use as supporting documentation. Um, the Emerge Australia um, Symptom Tracker and Activity Diaries can be really helpful there. Um, getting an, an OT assessment or a physiotherapy assessment can be really useful too. Um, and uh, the other practical one is Emerge Australia is a fantastic resource. Um, they do provide not just a whole lot of great information on their website. Um, there is an education module for GPs that you can do as well that takes about, oh, it's been a while since I've done it, might be 45 minutes or an hour. Um, and um, there are some clinical services too. So there's the, um, the telehealth nurse service uh, program and a patient support team as well that patients can contact directly. So, um, so to sum up, um, if you don't remember anything else, um, as a GP, MECFS is a complex condition um, with multiple symptoms, but the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis. So educate yourself and don't be afraid to diagnose someone if they meet the criteria. Um, the other thing is that educating someone on um, post-exertional malaise and pacing is the mainstay of treatment. Thank you. Well, thanks, Kirsten. Thanks to all of our presenters. That was absolutely um, fantastic. Um, but I guess we'll uh, go through some questions now. So um, I'm just going to have a quick look at the chat and we'll go through the ones that are down there. Um, and then um, I might uh, open up to the floor and we can um, raise some hands. Um, the first um, question is... Uh, uh, just on where you get access to the slides and the recordings, so that will be sent in an email um, after the session today, and it'll also be on uh, Northwest Melbourne PHN's website as well. Um, so, first question is: um, Do you have any thoughts on now Trexone in chronic fatigue syndrome? Uh, Kirsten, I might hand that one over to you. Sure. Um, yeah, I think I referred to that briefly. Um, that yes, it is something that is being trialled. Um, in MECFS, it's also being trialled in fibromyalgia, um, which is uh, quite a common comorbidity. Um, uh, that's probably um, as much as I can offer at this point. It's, it's at this stage not TGA approved for that use, but um, anecdotally, um, there's certainly outpatient uh, rheumatology clinics that are using it. Perfect. Um, and the next question, I'll, I'll have a go but if I've misinterpreted it feel free to uh, take yourself off mute and um, speak up but we've got how to manage comorbidity with depression uh, when scheduling of activities and exercise is often a useful strategy have I interpreted that correctly Laura would you um, you know you were talking before about um, uh, exercise as a as a strategy yeah, oh, look, I, I think what, you know, I've learned through my experience with connecting with patients is exercise and things like that for a healthy person whose cell is producing energy is fantastic. 
But when you're trying to exercise outside the available energy within the cell and you're flaring symptoms, it can have a negative impact. So someone who has a comorbidity of clinical depression who tries to exercise and run can in turn exacerbate their symptoms, reduce their function, leaving them with less capacity. So these patients, you know, I spoke with a lady yesterday who came with exactly this and what she was finding really supportive was going to a sauna. What that was doing is vasodilating, causing a massive crash, and she's in on the phone in tears. So what we discussed is, you know, what could she do within her energy limits? Um, and we came up with some strategies. She could call a friend. Um, she could put her comfortable slippers on, make a really lovely cup of tea, and she could watch one of her favourite movies. Um, you know, when things got really hard, rather than going for, you know, a run or a jog, this is a really healthy person who's, you know, just acquired long COVID, maybe she can take the cup of coffee to a park and sit in nature with a friend. So it's kind of adapting those things that you used to do to make yourself feel good in energy conserving, because exacerbating a crash is not going to help the mental health in the long term. And I would also say that, that you know, that's a, a great example of where um, psychological um, strategies and um, CBT or other psychological therapies are actually really helpful um, because so much of it is about reframing it in your own head as well. Yeah, and dealing with the grief and the loss of living with a chronic illness and loss of function, loss of support, loss of work. Um, it's so critical that that mental health gets cared for in the early stages. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, the next question might be for you, Laura. Um, can you confirm that Emerge is a resource available in all states? Um, yes, yeah, so it absolutely is. We're a national organisation. Uh, I get calls from around the country. Um, yeah, we're absolutely everywhere. We've got a 1800 number that people can call through. Um, I sometimes am there if I'm available. I'm also calling back patients and talking to GPs, OTs and anyone else who rings in and carers. Um, always leave a message and we'll get back to the patients. Otherwise, they can go to our website um, where it says how to get help. You can see that there's a telehealth nurse section and on there there's a button that says book a, a appointment. So if it's a patient, I'm happy for health professionals to come through that way as well. Yeah, they can book an appointment and we'll call them back. Terrific. Thanks for that, Laura. Um, that's all the questions we've got from the Q&A box. Um, uh, we're happy to take questions from the floor now if you'd like to raise your hand um, and ask the panel. Doesn't look like we've got too many yet this stage actually we do have one uh helen um uh yeah if you want to unmute yourself helen if you can Hi. can you hear me now yes hey helen um so there was some um, notes about communicating to schools or employers um but i'm wondering about partners and family because in a lot of ways they're the most important people um, and, you know, a partner may actually be doubting the diagnosis and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, when it comes to um, providing education, it's, um, uh, you know, obviously first and foremost to the, the person themselves, but then I suppose moving out in circles, it's to their immediate support network um, as long as they're um, happy for you to do so. So I'd certainly um, encourage them um, to bring um a partner with them to an appointment, for example, um, or that would be ideal to actually have a conversation or at least provide written information. But you're absolutely right that um, um, without that, uh, I suppose, being um, um, uh, being believed or having it legitimised, it can be a pretty lonely place to be. Yeah, and, and because it's not only that a partner is not um, necessarily understanding and maybe they do understand, but they then become carer in many ways as well mm -hmm. because they're having to pick up the things that the other person may not now be doing. So I think it's really critical for the partner to also have that, you know, care of support and understanding. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the Health Pathways also has a, um, a, a page, a resource page that um, lists um, carer support services particularly um, um, 
carer support more gen generally, but also for um, uh, uh, mental health issues as well in themselves, um, not just in the person they're caring for. Terrific. Thanks, Kirsten. Thanks, Helen. Um, uh, we do have a few more questions that have popped back into the Q&A box. Um, uh, the next question is, are there any specific OTs or psychologists you would recommend? And I'm also just going to flick this over to um, our next slide if you do want to leave some um, feedback as well. But um, sorry, I'll go through that question again. Are there any specific OTs or psychologists you would recommend? Oh, isn't that the holy grail, the secret list of um, people who are an expert in a particular niche area? Um, Laura, does Emerge keep a, a secret database? Look, I really wish that we did. Uh, what we've found in the past is that there's been a lot of conflict between different GPs without having a pathway such as this to follow. Um, patients can go to a doctor who's recommended by another person and they might feel dismissed or not heard. Um, and or they might not get the answer they're looking for. So because there hasn't been a standardised set of treatment, we haven't done that. Um, but with our Dr Richard Schlaufel doing some GPCE conferences with health pathways popping up, we will be building a database where we can um, invite doctors who have an interest in the area. But this project will probably launch next year. So not now, but hopefully moving forward, we will have something there because it's critical for patients to have access to knowledgeable practitioners. And I, I guess um, that's where I think um, the impact of long COVID um, um, I'm hoping is going to start making a difference that um, in the same way that um, I think there are far more psychologists and dietitians now that um, um, feel comfortable managing eating disorders than they were even 10 years ago. Um, I suspect that that's going to be changing um, uh, with um, MECFS as well. Um, the last time I checked, though, you know, just as, a, as an example, the um, Australian Society for Association for Exercise Physiologists, I've just forgotten the acronym off the top of my head, um, had a, a range of position statements, but they actually didn't have one on um, MECFS um, as of um, two months ago. But I, I would expect if you go back next year, um, that will have changed. And I think long COVID has got a fair bit to do with that. I think it's also really important to encourage our allied health professionals to access information. Kate's got some fantastic webinars for allied health professionals that she's put together. She did a presentation for APA. Um, so there's a lot of more information that's coming out um, and it's available. So if anyone wants to reach out uh, to me at Emerge Australia, we can provide some of those details if they're looking for you know, education as well for that kind yes. of cohort of professionals. And just thinking um, back to Louise's, um, uh, you know, talking about her own story where she had a, a GP who um, didn't necessarily know about know a lot, but um, was was very present and willing um, to travel the journey with her. Um, you know, one one suggestion would be if you know of a really good physiotherapist in the area who may not know much about MECFS, is um, um, encourage them to um, to learn more about it and work with their patient but yeah, yeah, it's, word, yeah word of mouth is absolutely still valid yeah um and just like personally i think what my gp did which uh, which i completely understand that you know the, the the heavy workloads that gps are under um it can be um you know often too overwhelming to try and think about you know complex care kind of that kind of um, aspect, but what my GP would often end up doing is is really sort of taking that time to um, offer that that extra bit of support. So then, even if she didn't necessarily know what to do or, like, or where to go next or who to see, who I should see next, I just felt better to advocate for myself in going somewhere next if that makes sense so it so it was giving me some skills to be able to then you know if I had to if I had to sort of suss out something like a a, a different avenue and obviously it's not something that my my GP knew directly that 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 this would assist me 
she was able to sometimes, um, you know, even sometimes just writing like an introductory letter, just, just to sort of like, you know, I mean, kind of like a referral, but sometimes just having that outline of, of this is what is currently where, where she's currently at as a patient. And we're coming to this, uh, we're, we're coming to see you for this in like, you know, for an OT or for a physiotherapist or something like that can offer can help me to then be able to explain and and advocate for myself a little bit better as well. So sometimes those things can be really useful for a patient trying to navigate all these areas. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, guys. Um, our next question is, um, is there a link for women in hormonal cycles and intensity of symptoms? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, menstrual cycles and uh, uh, certain phases of the menstrual cycle um, um, can be triggers. Yes. Uh, just to step in as a patient, um, my gynecologist that I started to, um, it was from basically about uh, 16, 17, 18. Um, she ended up making that decision of, of like, you know, we, we should really be stopping um, my period. So I, I don't get my periods anymore through just taking the pill um, because of the intensity of how bad my symptoms would get because of my cycle. So, yeah, so definitely from a patient experience, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, the next question is, um, is Emerge Australia collaborating with integrative GPs or traditional Chinese medicine doctors to assist in a holistic approach due to the multi-system disease, i.e. HPA axis dysfunction, uh, chemical toxin overload? I'll give that one to Kate. I think she's probably... <laughs> I'm sitting here going, oh. Look, I, I think... Um, I think what we're hoping to do is, you know, through these health pathways and then and then looking at uh, building research capacity and also hopefully eventually getting to some clinical practice guidelines at some point in some by some process. I think I think we're hoping to draw those different elements and different of research into a space where we're bringing it into all of medicine. I I, I don't really know how to. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I don't really know I think what else the, to say. The main <laughs> thing is that we're not really collaborating with doctors, rather, we're providing yeah. um, information. You know, we've got a research team that's doing digesting of yeah. um, you know, research data. They're also building, you know, our patient registry for research and connecting with different universities. And we've got a scientific and medical advisory committee. So it's more about providing knowledge out to the communities rather than collaborating directly with individual um, different organizations. What we say this is why I needed you, Laura. <laughs> it's whatever works for you. You know, if you've yeah. got a functional medicine doctor that you're working collaborative with and you've got a great relationship and that works for you, amazing. Um, we're all individual and the care that we seek has to align with our internal values as much as it does with connecting with that person and having a therapeutic relationship um, makes a difference. We're all different. There's not one size fits all. No, I think that's beautiful. I think that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions in the chat. So, um, yeah, if you do have one, feel free to raise your hands. Um, otherwise, um, if there's no more questions, um, yeah, uh, we might finish up there. So um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, I think it's been a terrific session. Um, and um, yeah, I'd like to thank all of our panel. I thought they presented beautifully this evening. Um, we do have uh, the uh, QR code there for our evaluation survey. So make sure you please um, provide a bit of feedback there because it, it um, provides us a lot of great insights into how to tailor our education events. Um, and Olivia's put a little note about it in the chat as well. Um, so yeah, we'll be sending out an email um, as well, just with the link to the recording as well and um, some of the resources that we mentioned. Um, and yeah, for future events, please visit the um, Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network um, education part of the website. Um, we've got some terrific events coming up and um, yeah, make sure you get to them.
So thanks again, guys, and that'll be everything. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, and thanks for facilitating, Jack. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my pleasure. And we're finishing on time. Yeah, we finished ahead of time, which is um, very impressive. <laughs>